to your Well, hi, I'm Alan McDaniel, and I want to welcome you to our Bible study here at Bible Talk as we continue on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this is, I believe, our 11th week, our 11th session in this, and I'm calling this Part 3, Traveling from Religious to Righteous, as we get into verse uh, 17. We're going to start tonight at chapter 5, Matthew 5, 17. But before we do that, let me show you, first of all, we're back in Orlando after being on the road for a month. We've just gotten back from a month uh, traveling to Tennessee. We were up in Nashville, and then over in Dallas, in the Dallas area, and then up in North Carolina. And it was a truly blessed trip. If you've, you've been watching the Bible studies, you've seen some from North Carolina and some from Dallas, as a matter of fact. But we're back here in Orlando, Florida, and I'm joined by my brother Mark and my lovely wife alice hello and before we start let's ask the lord's blessing on our time tonight mark if you would well, lord uh it's been a long time since we've been together and i just thank that thank you that they've gotten back and are able to be here just lord uh be with us tonight and put the words in our mouth that need to be spo spoken to pro proclaim your love for us Amen. 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 Well, I, I don't know that we'll cover all this tonight. I don't. I, I certainly don't think so. But what I want to I want to start by reading uh, as my phone beeps to let me know that it's time to be doing the Bible study. Uh, isn't technology blessed? All right. So, in any event, I want to read from verse seventeen through verse twenty in chapter five of Matthew. Because that's what we're going to cover in this in this block. Probably not all tonight, but uh, or this in this session. Jesus said, "Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, unless heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same." shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, let me just start by saying this evening, this is actually one of the most controversial uh, subjects in the history of Christianity, and it has been since the beginning of Christianity. I've said in the past, and I will continue to say all through this study, that the Sermon on the Mount is the most radical, fanatical teaching ever brought forth. It is, it is Jesus Christ, at the, at the, near the start of his ministry, preparing his disciples and his apostles to live that righteous life that he provides as a gift. All right. Uh, at the same time, it, I want to just say that it would be unfair to, to say that Jesus taught nothing that was new in the Sermon on the Mount. That's right. Okay? Uh, everything that he taught, he just brought great and true understanding to what had already been taught up to this time, mm -hmm. the yes. Law and the Prophets. You'd say he brought it in focus. Well, he brought understanding. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, and that's that's the clue and, the, and what's important in this study. All right? Because, and why I say it's so controversial is because we can talk about legalism and, and licentiousness, which we will during the course of the study. But the church has always been divided about particularly, not so much the prophets, although that's part of it, but the law. Legalistic. Well, <clears throat> Jesus is saying he didn't come to, to abolish the law. No. And the law is still in place. And that's, what, that's, the, that's the whole point. But this has been the great debate, and, and I will talk about this, but if you go to Acts 15 in the early church, when Paul came back and talked about how God was moving powerfully through his ministry and through his life to touch Gentiles, and then the question arose now that non-Jews were coming into a relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what was their relationship with the law? 
and, and believers in Jerusalem. We're talking about because there were Pharisees who had been, who accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And yet now they are demanding that new converts, Gentiles, be subject to the law, all of the law. Mm -hmm. And this was the cause of the first Christian council. It's recorded in Acts 15. Now I'm sure we'll talk about that. Well, this is the first time he addresses that about the law. Well, it's, this is early on in his ministry. That's what I say. Right. This is the beginning. So and, and that, it's not just the first time. I mean, it's, it's important to understand this is the beginning of his teaching. Because it's at the Sermon on the Mount that he first, taught. This is his first right. sermon. So, so it, it's important to understand that he is preparing them mm -hmm. for this righteous walk in life. And this is one of the first things that he says. And I, my impression is, over 35 years of preaching, that very few people take the Sermon on the Mount as a whole. It's parts. You know, people will talk about this verse and that <coughs> verse and this part of it and that part of it. But very few people get the cohesiveness and the important and the importance of the context of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, I said in the beginning that when we looked at the Beatitudes, this is the first thing he says. Right. And and there's there's purpose to everything that God does. And then the next thing is what we covered in the last session which was that once he had talked about this, then he says to them, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, because now he is preparing to send them out as ambassadors for Christ. These are going to be the representatives of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. He's leaving, and he's, these are the people who are going to represent him. Mm -hmm. So first come the Beatitudes, then come that. And then before we get into the in-depth teaching, he starts by saying, but don't you think that I came to abolish the law? Or the prophets. Now, you have to understand something. And I, I think very few people do understand this. Jesus Christ did not come to, or did he, start a new religion? No. no or a new not. faith? Mm -mm. No. But there is a thing called dispensationalism, and that's basically what it teaches. Is that Christ came, and everything that was passed is gone, is gone right. and we're starting he something new. It. The Old Testament was a, the foundation for what he's going to build upon. The Old Testament. See, here, here's one of the problems that I have. And I understand we talk. There is a, there's a covenant. A covenant is an agreement. There is an, a, there's an old covenant and a new covenant. But let me, let me just finish because this is important. But most or too many Christians treat what we call the Old Testament as secondhand scriptures. And the fact is when Paul wrote to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and said, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable. He's talking about from Genesis to Malachi, because that's the scriptures that existed when he wrote, wrote that. All right? There is no such thing as secondhand scripture. No. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable. It's all important. Okay? You mentioned covenant. Covenants are something that even... You know, are are added by two or more people, and even if one side doesn't abide by the agreement, the other side will. You have to, that's what a covenant is. Covenant is an agreement. And just because somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to, it doesn't necessarily relieve you of your responsibility to do what you agree to. But let's not go down that rabbit hole. Okay? I mean, the, the, the fact is, when I talk about dispensationalism, and, what, and the point that's important here is that, that basically, People think today that Jesus Christ came and created Christianity and Judaism passed into uh, a spiritual oblivion. That is absolutely, positively not the case. And, and this is what's important here is Jesus is making sure that that is clearly understood before he starts to teach. He wants these people to know. He's not, he didn't come to, to put the law away or the prophets away. He is the fulfillment of that. All right? And he says, if you don't, you know, this is not taught. We're, we're failing what God is calling us to. The problem is, and, and I, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here. What, what we're talking about is what makes you right, what gives you a right relationship with God the Father. I have a question. Okay. If if you talked about the, that he didn't come to abolish the law. <clears throat> but what is it um, that Paul was saying in Corinthians? 
about the um, the letter of the law. Okay, you way ahead of me here. Okay, you really are. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, That's something you're going to cover. Absolutely, we're going to we're going to talk about this because this is a really really important issue. All right, I, this is an incredibly important issue. It's been an important issue throughout the history of these last of the church for these past two thousand years. Mm -hmm. This has been the great debate. Yeah. And as I say, it started in Jerusalem when the, when the first Gentiles were being saved and the Jewish believers were demanding that they, that they be subject to the law. All right? And Paul is saying that's not what it's about. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Paul is not saying, let's toss the law out. Mm -hmm. And that's the misunderstanding and the problem. Okay. All right? We, we are wrong to believe we, but this is our culture. This is what we've been taught to believe for the last 1,700 years is that Christianity is a new religion. Right. I'm going to tell you something. Until my 33rd birthday, I was a part of a church that, that is called Christian. I had no relationship with the Lord whatsoever. Not at all. I had no concern for the Lord no. whatsoever. But the day that I sat down and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, for the first time, I became a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I became grafted in to the household, to the family of God called Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, I will sit here tonight and tell you, I know that that upsets Jews and Christians alike. Jewish people freak out when I, if, I, if I have this conversation with them because how dare I call myself a Jew? Christians freak out when they hear this, how dare I call myself a Jew? But the fact of the matter is, when we, as I say, I want to cover this. Think about, think about this, right? Who's the greatest teacher on the law in the New Testament? Paul. Who is the greatest scholar on the law? Not Peter, not Matthew, not Mark, not Luke. Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He is an expert in the law. Yes. And he comes along and says, it is not the law that makes you right with God the Father. Mm -hmm. That upset the apple cart. However, how you upset the apple cart, that's what brought about all of this debate. But at the same time that he's saying that the law doesn't make you right with God, he was also saying that the law is good. And I just want to read you a couple of verses. And as a matter of fact, if you want to talk about the law, you want to go read the letter to the Romans. Now remember, this is Paul writing to Gentile believers. And this is the greatest teaching on grace, on salvation, on, on, the, on the forgiveness of God, on the atoning work of Jesus Christ, and our relationship with the law is to be found in Paul's letter to the Romans. So just listen to a couple of verses here from Paul's letter. Right? I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? He's talking about the Jews. He hasn't rejected the Jews. I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles. You, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich fruit of the olive tree. That's all from Romans chapter 11. Paul is saying, and he's writing to us Gentiles, that what's happened is, first of all, God has not rejected the Jews. But what he has done is he's made a way, which he prophesied all along, that he opened the door and grafted us into that family of God. Why? Because, and this is what seems like neither Jews nor Gentiles believe or understand. Paul wrote in the, in the second chapter of Romans, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one outwardly inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but by God. Now, you know what? He is quoting, or he is, he is commenting on what was written in the Torah, in the law, in Deuteronomy, when God has spoken and said that you are to circumcise the foreskin of your heart. It was always a spiritual relationship with God that he was, that he was creating and seeking. All right? 
We have to worship him in spirit and in truth. This is what Jesus said to the woman at the well. It's always been about the spirit, not about the outward. So, it's not one who is a Jew outwardly, but one who is one inwardly. Now, if you have come into a right, and God has given you as a fulfillment of the prophecies that he made, he's taken that heart of stone and given you a heart of flesh, you have been circumcised in your heart. You are a Jew inwardly. So before Jesus would send his disciples, his apostles, out to spread the word, he needed them to understand this. Remember, the Great Commission at the end of the Gospel of Matthew is when Jesus says, Go therefore into, to, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Listen to this part. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. So, the Apostle Paul, who is the greatest theologian of the law amongst all of the apostles, and the greatest teacher of the inability of the law to make one right with the Father, still teaches the Gentile church. So then, the law is holy. And the commandment is holy and righteous and good. All right? In the same letter that he writes about the grace of God, the free gift of salvation, about how faith makes us righteous with God, he still says that the law is good and the commandments are holy. When he wrote to Timothy, now remember, he's instructing Timothy, a Gentile believer, to go out and teach other Gentiles. And he says this, we know that the law is good. If one uses it lawfully. That's 1 Timothy 1a. So there's a, there's a whole gigantic misunderstanding about the law and Paul and the law. Now, we're going to, we have to understand this, okay? So when Paul speaks of this new covenant of righteousness that's obtained through the work of Christ, Paul doesn't speak evil of the law, but he says in 2 Corinthians 3, 3 6, that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So what it, what we require is a spiritual appraisal and understanding of the law. And that's what Jesus is dealing with here in the Sermon on the Mount. Spiritual appraisal. It is a spiritual appraisal and a greater understanding of what has been written and spoken in the law and the prophets. They had it, but they didn't understand it. Well, because in, in the covenant that was made in the covenant that was made in the Old Testament, that they were being taught by the Spirit. Well, that makes uh, that's true enough. But it was David three thousand years ago, a thousand years before the birth of Christ, who was talking about well, it's not it's not sacrifice that the law requires. It's he, Samuel. I mean, over and over and over, to obey is better than to sacrifice. God doesn't see this. It's, it's not it's not about that that makes you right with God. So they didn't understand the law, all right? And now Jesus is here. And as I said, he's not teaching new things in the Sermon on the Mount. He is bringing light to the things that already existed, okay? What, what, when we go out, now I, I read Jesus Christ, he's, he's going to send these people out. He's sending us all out yes. to share the word. Yes. To do what? To do to do to what? Share the good news of Jesus Christ. Is that better yet called the gospel? Is that yes, the, it is. So we're, we're called to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. That sounds simple and it sounds so easy. But the question is, are we doing that? Mm -hmm. Or are we, instead of preaching the gospel, are we preaching our culture? Yes, absolutely. Okay? Absolutely, yes. He wants the mission effort, what we talked about in the last session, mm -hmm. the salt of the earth and the light of the world, to bring the new life of the spirit, not the culture of the past. The Jews were not interested in the law as much as they were interested in their traditions that were built around the law. Okay? The commandments become more important, or the commentaries became more important to them than the work that they comment on. It's about, now, I don't know if you're familiar with the terms, the Talmud and the Torah. The, the Torah is the first five books of the Bible, okay, which is typically called the law. Mm -hmm. 
This is that's the word of God. And that word of God is good. Yes. That word of God is holy. That word is God breathed that and word profitable. Is everlasting. That word is everlasting. This is what it says. So the, the grass withers, the flower flayed, the flower flayed. <laughs> okay. The flower fades. All right, the grass withers, but the word of God will stand forever. Right. All right, that's the prophets. That's right. That's the prophets, basically speaking about the law. Mm-hmm. Right. But then came the commentaries, the Talmud. This is the rabbinical teachings right. on right. 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 the Torah. And now it's like when when the Jewish people over the centuries became more interested in what the teachers said about the Word than what the Word said itself. Isn't that happening today? It is absolutely happening in the church today. Worse you know, than I've said, I, I have said, and you know, I'm, I am here because part of the ministry that God has given me is to teach the Word. The, word, but, the pure Word. You know, as I said, we just came back from a month on the road and I was preaching in all over, all over, in Tennessee, Texas, and North Carolina. And and what I do what I do typically when I get up to, to preach. I tell people, make sure yes, that you test. test the things I say against the Word of God. That's right. Because, And I'll tell people this. Ultimately, when all is said and done, you have to understand that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It, it's you hearing from God, not hearing from me. That's right. I'm trying to point you to these things mm-hmm. so something will spark that you'll go... And speak to the Lord. You'll meditate on it. You'll converse with God. That's called praying, by the way. Because that's what it's about. I believe in teaching. I believe, you know, commentaries are right. But not as a replacement from hearing from from God. Something to stir you, but you've got to go hear from the Lord. So, in, in any case, let me get back on here. We have that same problem in the church today. As I travel, I'll talk to people and I'll be sharing the word and talking about the word. And I'll say, you know, and God said this and they'll say, well, pastor so-and-so says this. Well, that's all right. It's all right that pastor so-and-so says that because that's what God. And then I'll, we'll continue our conversation and I'll say, well, this guy intelligent. And it, it dawns on me that every time I talk about the word, they're talking about what some man said about the word rather than what they have heard from God. And therein lies the danger. God has appointed teachers in the church for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. But you, it can't replace your hearing from God. You know, when you're hearing somebody speak the word, and if it does stir in you something, it it's, creates this spark, you should realize that it's not that man up there that just spoke to you. You should realize that, absolutely. It is God. I was, so, yeah, I was so blessed. We were in uh, Quinlan, Texas. And, and I uh, shared the word I preached there. And uh, after that, I got a number of people contacted me. And, and the thing that blessed me so much was one person contacted me and said, boy, this really spoke to me. This yes. really got me excited. And then another person called, you know, contacted me and said, boy, this got me. And there are different, different things. things right. You know, there were different things in the sermon. It's not the whole sermon. Mm-hmm. But it was like God spoke to That's the spirit of God yes. speaking yes. to them about what is what the Spirit is trying to reach them with. Yeah. So, you know, different people are getting different things out of this message Amen. because that's the Lord. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to go somewhere, may God make it so. They're not going to go somewhere and say, well, you should have heard what Pastor or what Alan said when he was. That's not, it doesn't matter what I say. You've got to hear from the Lord, all right? Mm-hmm. So we, we just need to be understanding that. But it's really under, important to understand when I talk about culture, Another word for the culture is the traditions that we have built up, the Jews built up, and the church has built up. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, those traditions or that culture becomes more important than the word that was supposed to be the, you know, the foundation of all of this. Supersedes. Everything. Just to give you a couple of examples, and I think this is, uh, I think this is, but please listen to what I'm saying about this. In John chapter 9, that's the account of a man who was born blind. And you can, you can go read that. and I think we even have a sermon up on our Bible yes, talk website about it. Mm-hmm. But in uh, John 9, 16, here's what the Pharisees said. Some of the Pharisees, therefore, were saying, 
This man is not from God. They're talking about Jesus. He's not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. And then later on in verse 24, it says, So a second time they, this is the Pharisees, called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know this man, Jesus, we know this man is a sinner. They say, well, how do they know that Jesus is a sinner? Well, it says, because he didn't keep the Sabbath. Well, the, the, the untruth here is Jesus never broke any law. He's a fulfillment. He said, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Right, right. but you have to understand that Jesus Christ is sinless. That means that he never, ever broke in any way, not the slightest bit, not the tiniest bit, broke any law, which meant that he kept the Sabbath according to the word. But he didn't keep the Sabbath according to the traditions that the Jews had built up around the word. And that ruffled their feathers. Well, it's oh, not that they ruffled their feathers. They tested him. But they were testing and the they were testing it on, on, right, on their culture. And I'm going to use that word. I want to culture. use the word culture and tradition interchangeably. Okay. All right? Mm -hmm. it's under, because culture comes from the word cultivate. Mm -hmm. And when you cultivate something, this doesn't happen overnight. It grows. Little by little by little, it grows. Right. You water it, you nurture it, and it mm -hmm. grows and grows and grows. And that's how tradition builds. And that's where you get your tradition. So, so they had all of this tradition built around the Sabbath, and Jesus didn't keep their tradition, so they knew he was a sinner. Mm -hmm. Well, why not say we do the same thing in a church? I mean, there are churches. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a gross overstatement just to simplify this. It'll probably upset you anyhow. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we're coming up to Easter. Well, you're coming up to Easter. Maybe I'm coming up to Passover. But that's another story. And, and so many churches will do these, you know, they're going to color Easter eggs and roll the Easter eggs and hide the Easter eggs. And if, if I, which I have done in the past, been involved or at a church where they're doing that, and I say, you know, I'll I take no part in this. I, I will have no part of that. And therefore, in their eyes, I'm not a good Christian because I don't do Easter egg hunts. That's a fact. Or a lot of the tradition that's built up, if you've had any contact with the Catholic Church, I was raised a Catholic. Listen, as we are doing this right now, it's St. Patrick's Day. Um, I'm not going to go out and drink green beer to celebrate some, you know, St. Patrick's Day. And while most people don't take that as a test of faith, trust me, there are many, many, many who get upset because I'm not celebrating what St. Patrick did, or may have done, or may not have done, oh, yeah. through all of the, you know, the, I'm, I'm not going to get into that. No. But, the, but the point is, we're testing people about their relationship with God, not based on what the Word says, but on the tradition that we've built, on the culture that we've developed. And this is troubling to me in great ways. I had the opportunity which was a real important thing to me, a blessing, because I, I got to preach. I'll, I'll just, I got to preach in a communist country that was led by a dictator, mm -hmm. a communist country where I have been praying for that country for yeah. decades, for many, many years, mm -hmm. and praying for that dictator for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And continue to pray. And continue to pray. Mm -hmm. And during the time we were there, I traveled there, and it's not easy to travel there, and you were, because neither they don't t typically want you, and our government doesn't want you to go. Um, I traveled there with another pastor, a spirit-filled, Bible-believing pastor. And we were really blessed to stay. We didn't stay in a hotel. We stayed in a house of a family, of a man, who was actually involved in the revolution that put that dictator in place. And he had been very prominent in the government or in, uh, as a businessman that ran one of the biggest businesses in that country. And I got to share a lot with him. Because every morning I would get up and wander through the capital city and just pray. And he asked me if he could join me, and, and he did. And it was just a, a wonderful experience and opportunity to get to know him and for him to get to know me. And for him to share what was on his heart and for me to be able to share back with him what was on my heart. And what's on my heart is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But on the other hand, the fellow, the other pastor who had traveled with me, all he wanted to do, and all I ever heard him do with this guy, was talk about democracy mm -hmm. and freedom and patriotism mm -hmm. and all this stuff that is very important to a lot of churches today. Yes, it is. You know, the, the flag waving. Yes. And the, the fact is, 
That's not what's going to set you free. Not at all. If I upset you, hey, here I am. Write to me, office at BibleTalk.com. Whom the Son of God sets free, they're free indeed. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I'm going to say this, and I know this is going to hurt a lot of you. And it's not that I want to demean anybody for the sacrifices they've made or what they've done. And I promise you, back in the day, I was a warmonger. Mm -hmm. But all of the blood spilled on all of the beaches of all of the places in the world over all of the centuries has never set anybody free. No. Because Jesus said, if you sin, you're a slave to sin. And the only thing that can set you free from sin is a right relationship with God Amen. through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that can set you free. That's the only power. And that's the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the message that we are to carry forth. But here in this country, so many of the quote-unquote conservative Bible-believing churches, mm -hmm. just, they're going to test you, your, your Christianity, by how patriotic you are. Well, you know, I'm just going to tell you this, and may God deal with you. Tell me that's, that's the Word of God, because it is not the Word of God. And you need to recognize that, and you need to deal with it in your own life. Because as long as that's what you're out there sharing and what's important in your life, you will not be doing it. And this is why Jesus is trying to get the people prepared to know it's not the culture we're supposed to be preaching. It is the Word of God that we are to be preaching. Because that's what has the power to change men's lives. You know, I, I had a conversation I thought was interesting just the other day with a dear brother. And I don't know how we got into this. He started talking about he, he's been in conversation and prayer with another fellow. And they're involved in evangelism. And they were talking about the fact that um, you, can't, you can't preach the gospel cross-culture. Mm. You know, people have to be of the same culture in order to preach the gospel. And I said, I told him, I, I disagree with that. Not only do I disagree, the more I thought about it, Just, not only do I disagree with it, I, that is such a dangerous, dangerous teaching. Absolutely. The fact of the matter is we have been blessed. I preach this gospel on five continents. Mm -hmm. I have, I have preached the gospel of Jesus. I'm, listen, I'm a New York kid. I grew up in Manhattan. I'm a city boy like there's never been a city boy. I am I'm a city boy. We lived in the bush in Central America. I shared the gospel with my Indians. Yes. I shared the gospel with so many people in the Caribbean in, the, in that kind of black colonial uh, heritage that came from the slave trade mm -hmm. in England. I've shared the gospel with them. I shared the gospel with Latin people. Yes all over Latin America. I mean, in, all over in Latin America, in, in Mexico, in Central all America, and Central America, and all the different cultures. But I don't preach culture. No. I preach the gospel. That's right. And the gospel is as valid today to a mind as it is to, to a pygmy. As it is to a pygmy. And that's right, because Mark was with us. We went to a pygmy, you know, oh, share the gospel yeah. with the pygmies out in West Africa. You don't, Paul said he was all things to all men. If you're going to preach culture, brother, you better be of the same culture. Otherwise, you're going to offend people. Because you're talking about their culture. I don't talk about people's culture. This, I talk about their this sin. Should, this should be our culture. It is. It's supposed to be. This is what exactly. you're supposed to, this is what should cultivate everything in our lives. But what happens when you get off that track? I, I have to tell, I'm going to be real honest with you. Please do. It, it does say once or twice... Paul says it, in fact, that our citizenship is in heaven. Philippians 3.20. Okay, if our citizenship is in heaven, the culture of that citizenship is the kingdom. Is different from all other cultures. From everything in the world. Absolutely. Right. So if you infuse the culture that you were born fleshly with, and you bring that in with the Spirit... Okay. Now, let's go back to no, no, the yeah, verses yeah, yeah. No, where no, no. we're yeah, saying yeah. salt of the earth or yeah. light of the world. You're blocking the light. You're polluting the salt. No, you're preaching Egypt. Yeah. You're also doing that? Well, no, you are doing that. Oh. You're, you're preaching Egypt. You're, you're going, going back, back into the world. You're, right. Exactly. Exactly. All right? yeah. um, the fact is that we are to be preaching the word of God that has that power to change people. You will be no more offensive to a pygmy than somebody in New York City if it's the Word of God you're preaching, because the Word of God doesn't change. It doesn't change to suit the culture. That's why now, Paul could be all things but that, but That's one of the problems is that when you try and change the Word to suit the culture in any way, you're going to run into a problem. Now, does that mean... 
that I don't believe that there is there is a purpose in, like I said, Paul went to Timothy and got this man who was basically a Gentile to go out and preach to Gentiles. When we go to places, I try and get people who are native to the land to disciple them and bring them up to be able to preach the gospel there. But it still can't be, even though they're from there, it can't be their culture that they're preaching. And I, I said, and I believe this with all my heart, I have been able to turn that into an advantage in every place. You know, we're about to, we spent uh, five, six months in England last year. We're about to head off to England for a few months again right now. And as often as not, I'll stand up before a congregation that I don't know, and I'll say to them right off the bat, I'll tell them, you know, you got to bear with me. I don't speak English. Mm -hmm. I, only, I only speak American. I'm learning English. Mm -hmm. Because it is, in fact, a different language. Yes. And there are different customs over there. Yes. They may not be incredibly dissimilar because of the relationship between our culture, but they are different. Mm -hmm. But I admit that right in front, I'll say it right in front. But I'm not trying to get them to say trunk instead of boot. No. I'm not trying to get them to say truck instead of lorry. Right. I'm not trying to make them like me. Exactly. I'm trying to make them or open the door for them to become like Jesus. Jesus. Not like me, not like George Washington, not like an American, but like Jesus Christ. And when you don't do that, you are failing to be that salt of the earth and that light of the world. I'm going to tell you, and I said this, I don't, I don't even like to have to admit this, but it's the truth. There were times when Alice and I lived in Central America as missionaries. When we sat down and prayed, oh, Lord, stop these missionaries from coming in. Yes. That's true. Because those missionaries would do more harm to what we were trying to accomplish than good. Because they would come in and try to make little Americans That's right. out of these people rather than Christians out of these people. And that has been a problem in the church, at least in our Western culture, for hundreds and hundreds of years. That, you know, it was a matter of trying to change the culture of people. From, from native Indian to English or French or Spanish or Portuguese rather than trying to bring them to the place where it was the word of God that they're supposed to look like. Let me tell you something. God is not trying to make anybody look like an American. Let me just, okay, let me just finish this, this sentence, all right? It says that if your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, then God foreknew you. That's why your name is written yes. there. Yes. And he has predestined you to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. He is not trying to make you look like a New Yorker mm -hmm. or a Londoner mm -hmm. or a pygmy or, or anything else that you can conceive that's out there in the world. His only goal is to make you look and act and speak like his son, Christ Jesus. Not every culture in the world has been cultivated by the world. And this is what we are battling. And if you want to, to bring culture, it is the culture of Jesus Christ because you're supposed to be tra tra changing them into the image of Jesus yes. Christ. So this is the culture of Jesus yes. Christ. And, and you want to say, and Jesus Christ lived the culture of his father. Yes, he, did. he didn't do anything that no. the father didn't tell him to do. So he didn't see the father. He didn't speak anything that he didn't hear the father say. He was not, I promise you, he was not imitating anybody in the world. And the Word of God says that we are to be imitators of God. Yes. Ephesians 5.1. So this is really a significant and serious thing. Because again, it goes back to the issue of, you know, it's not the matter of the, the, the law that he was, it's what people think of the law. It's how, how they have interpreted it in their own minds. Even though Proverbs, you know, Solomon spoke and said, lean not on your own understanding. It's all about their own understanding, rather than being led by the Spirit. Forget what lies behind. Forgetting what lies behind, and press on to a risk. Okay. So, and anyhow, to, I, just, I believe that with all my heart. We have to f make sure that when we have a quote-unquote missionary effort, when we're going out to share the gospel with people, that it is indeed the gospel that we're sharing. Not the traditions that we have built up in the church over the last couple of thousand years. I mean, if, if you think that somebody is one to the Lord because they're coloring Easter eggs, shame on you. It is about Jesus Christ, 
who over that Passover, that passage, was crucified, died, was buried, and rose from the dead. That's what it's about. And that's what we're to proclaim. Amen. Okay. Now, to, to talk about it, this is, uh, it just struck me today. If I talk to you mm -hmm. about Jesus Christ being tempted in the wilderness, mm -hmm. right? This is one of, this is the greatest spiritual battle, I think. I mean, you know, we, we've seen this, this confrontation between Jesus and the devil in person, right? Mm -hmm. How does Jesus deal with this? It is written. The word. It is written. Right. It is written. Okay. Now, I'm going to get a little ahead of myself here. But I, you probably know this in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. How many times did Jesus say, You have heard. You have heard. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Right. Yes. You have heard. that you Right? Mm -hmm. Over and over, you'll hear Jesus says, You have heard. Then he goes on to say, but I say. Mm -hmm. You got that fixed in your yes, mind? Yes. I'm looking at a few of them right okay, here. A few of them, okay. Right, right, right. Isn't it interesting? He didn't say to these people, it was written, you shall love your enemies. No. I mean, you love your neighbor yes. and hate your enemy. He said, this is what you heard. And as he takes us from that place where we are being religious, following the traditions of men and the culture of men. And by the way, remember in Mark, Jesus said to the Pharisees, how nicely you set aside the commandments of God to hold fast to your tradition. Right? right? He's not saying, okay, this is written, but now I'm changing it. He's saying, this is what you've heard. Right. Right. But now I'm saying, I'm saying to you, he who is the word made flesh who dwelt among us, the living word of God. Because too much of what we're believing is not based on what is written, but on what we've heard. And not heard from him, because faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. But we've heard it from, if even if it's not from the world, another we've, culture. we've heard it, no, but a particular culture. The culture of religion. That's why I'm saying, I said this when we began, this is a transition that Jesus is making in our lives from religion to righteousness. He is saying when he says you've heard, you you know you have heard, he talks about the religious practice of the day. But then he says, "But I say." When I use the word religion, I'm not using it like James does, which is the only right way. Because then you know what religion is? Religion has nothing to do with your relationship with God. Religion has everything to do with your relationship with, with the rest of the world. Keep helping yourself the, helping the widows and orphans. Keep That's religion. Unspotted from the world. But when I use the word religion here, I'm using it in its common sense. It's the practice of the Pharisees. It's all of the things, you know, that they do, the this and the that, all of the, all of the religious culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's not the religious culture that makes you, has anything to do with your relationship with God that's good. It is your righteousness that makes your relationship with God. And Jesus is trying to show us, and I've said this over and over in the study so far, this is training in righteousness. Paul said to, to Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for training in righteousness. Jesus is speaking now. He is training in righteousness. The thing that stands against our living righteous is our practice of religion. Oh, that's a, st a statement. Say that again. Well, I'm probably going to get enough negative comments on that one. He, he is changing us from the practice of religion to a walk of righteousness. Mm. That's good. But that's, that's what, and it has to be here. And that's why I said, you've got to take the Sermon on the Mount as a whole. Mm. I, I said in the very beginning, when we started with the Beatitudes, that the Beatitudes is a sermon. The rest is commentary and instruction. Okay? On how to live out the blessings of the Beatitudes. But before he goes into that, he says, okay, he gives us the Beatitudes, and then he says, now, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth, that means you're going to take what I've just shared with you and bring it out to the world. But before you go out into the world and do this, you need to understand about your relationship with the Word, with the Law and the Prophets. Don't go out thinking 
that we've tossed out everything now and we're starting something brand new. He said, don't think I came to abolish the law and the prophets. So before he goes into in-depth teaching on all of this, you've got to get this straight in your head. It's not about religion. It's about righteous. So the law is religion. No, the, no. no. The tradition of the law that tradition was built up was became about. religion. Listen, how many Christians would say, just offhand, I'm talking about Bible-believing spirit, right. if I said, okay, the law is, and they're going to say, oh, so you go watch, don't get, don't get legal, watch the law, it's bad. First of all, how many laws are there? How many laws are there? Hundreds. In, in, in the, Torah, the Torah, how many? It's a lot. It's how many? I don't know. 613, if you want to know. Okay. I was going to say 666. But. Oh, 613. Mm. So, so the church now has moved away from the law, right? Mm. And how many? Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> Except, you know, I, I did graduate work in a Catholic seminary. Don't forget that. And the Catholic, Catholic church is led by canon <coughs> law. How many? How many canon laws are there? 1,200. 1,800. Three times. The Three times the amount of the law that would say yes. So, here's what we've accomplished, I'm boys and girls. Twice as much. No, no, three times. There's, there's 17, it's just, just under 1,800 laws in the canon law of the Catholic Church. So, we, yes, we put aside the law. The law doesn't do anything good. And now we've created, there's 1,800, three times as many laws in the canon law. Oh, hello. I don't think I want to be a Jew. <laughs> well, no, we, we need to wake up. But remember, remember what I said now, before we go any further in this. The law is not bad. It's our understanding of the law. Paul says that the letter kills, but the Spirit brings life. The law is good. After the death, after the burial, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, after the day of Pentecost, Paul is saying the law is good, the law is holy. And here's a guy that's saying, but you don't need it to be right with God. It's not, that's not what makes you right with God. But maybe it has, still has purpose. And when Jesus sends the, every, you know, the, the apostles out, he says, teach them to do what I commanded you. It's still about obedience. How many times have I preached and said, you know, there's a, there's a bad teaching in the church that says that faith leads to the promises of God. That's, that's almost right. But it's not true. You see, faith leads to obedience. And obedience leads to the blessings of God and the promises of God. Read Deuteronomy 28. It's still the God-breathed word, eternal word. It hasn't been abolished. It hasn't been wiped away. And what Deuteronomy 28 says, if you hear his voice, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, if you hear his voice and you hearken to it, you obey it, then the blessings of God will come upon you. They'll overtake you. They'll flat run you over. He'll bless you in the city. He'll bless you in the country. He'll bless you coming in. He'll bless you going out. He'll bless your husband. He'll bless your wife. He'll bless your kids. He'll bless your kitty cats, your puppy dogs. He'll bless the work of your hands. He'll bless the fruit of your back. He'll bless everything in your life. If, hearing him, you obey him. What does it say in Hebrew 13? By faith, It says in a, Hebrews 11, no, 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed. That's Hebrews 11, 8. Yes. yes. By faith, Abraham obeyed. Mm -hmm. So it's still about obedience. Now, it's not legalism, but we're still to be subject. The first, uh, let me go back and say this again, and I know you've heard this from me before. We were in, I think, either in London or Oxford, England, and I'd been ministering to a, a, a group there for a weekend. And at the end of this, the woman who had arranged all this said to me, just kind of off the cuff, she said, what's the most important thing you've learned in 35 years of preaching the gospel? Mm -hmm. And I thought, I take these things seriously. And I thought about that for a minute. And I said, okay, here's the most important thing that I've learned. Jesus is Lord, I'm not. That means he says, go, I go. That means he says, stay, I stay. He's the boss. I've got to obey it is about the authority of Jesus Christ that has not been pushed away. We will, during the course of the study on this part, talk about those three factors. There is legalism. Legalism is where you get strict under the law because you think that it is the law that makes you right with God. And that binds you and up. And binds you up. This is what Paul wrote to the Galatians. Christian believers who had put themselves in a place back where they were subject to the law to be right with God. And Paul said, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? What you began in the spirit, and now you're going to perfect in the flesh? You got to watch for legalism. But on the other side of that, that 
seesaw is licentiousness. Licentiousness means that you think because of what Christ did, you're not free to do whatever you want. And that was in Corinthians. Yep. Here's what I, I you know, I, I had the opportunity, we were in Jerusalem last year. As a matter of fact, Mark met us over in, in did I say Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were in Israel. We, we wound up in Jerusalem. Mark met us in Jerusalem. But prior to that, we were uh, up in Netanya mm -hmm. and staying with a dear Jewish couple, Jewish, Jewish couple. And in the midst of this conversation, one of the things that this man said to me, and he is an expert on Scripture, both New and Old Testament. And he said to me, one of the things that concerned him or upset him, I, I don't remember the exact terminology he used, was that Christ has made, it's, you know, anybody can anybody can get to heaven. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, it's, he's, he wiped away all of the, this, you don't have to be obedient to the law. That's basically what he said. And this is most, what most religious Jewish people believe. Yeah. Oh, contraire. Oh, contraire. Jesus made it easier? Well, you know, in a sense he made it easy because he gave us the Holy Spirit to give us the power to do everything that he calls us to. Do I believe in tithing? I believe in tithing. Is that because I believe I'm subject to the old law? No. no. You know what I'm It has nothing to do with the old law or little to do with the old law because the old law of tithing said, okay, you are obligated to give a tenth Perfect. Well, Jesus, let me tell you this right now. Jesus, wipe that out. Yes, he did. Hallelujah. Yes, you are no longer obligated to give a tenth. Yeah. Give it now, all. it's 100%. That's right. He brought that understanding. Now, it's not a tenth of what you have because you have nothing. Well, it is 100%. And the Sabbath was for one day, and he said, now it's all seven days. Well, yes, because if you have an understanding, rest. Rest it is that they are, we're supposed to rest in the Lord. I mean, I, you know, I, I can't go down into that, but if you read Isaiah 58 and understand that, the Sabbath becomes every single day. Mm -hmm. And over and over and over. But that's appraising it spiritually. Thus, the letter kills and the Spirit exactly. brings life. Exactly. But when you when you appraise this stuff spiritually, you be, the, the stuff being the Word of God. Right. When you start to appraise it spiritually, you understand that the, the requirements of Jesus are incredibly more Free. demanding. No, more, on, on the one hand, more demanding... Right than the law ever thought of being, and on the other hand, easier than the law ever was, because he gives you the power to do it, he gives you the willingness to do it, and you, you, you can do what you couldn't do before, before the law brought death, because you can't do it. It's impossible. It's impossible. But now, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And now you can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That argument that the Jewish people make about, oh, you get off scot-free. Just ask them a question. Have you done all the law? Have you been 100% in it? Have you maybe failed no, one time in one aspect of it? No, because nobody can keep the law. Right. Okay. And it also, one of the scriptures that you didn't mention yet is a tu uh, the law is a, tu is a tutor. Yes, to bring us to Christ. I think there's probably how many I, Well, based okay. on, we're talking about the, the law right. and that. I was going to ask another question. All right, go ahead. When you say that we have to, um, when you hear the Lord, you have to obey the Lord and then the blessings. But let me just, I'm thinking about that, and I'm taking, wait, but when oh, you hear yeah. the Lord, you have to believe Him, don't you? Of course, well, you have to believe he's Lord, first of all. Right. If you believe that he is Lord, anything you hear from him because becomes what you have to do. Yeah, it's a requirement. It says in, in Romans that when you, when you believe in your heart and confess with your heart. Yeah. But that's, that is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Right. And, and salvation is about the Lordship of Jesus Christ who atoned for our sins. That's why I say the most important thing is understanding he's Lord. When Paul and Silas were in a jail in Philippi, and this Roman jailer says to him, what must I do to be saved? The first thing he says is, believe on the Lord <clears throat> Jesus Christ. If you don't understand that Jesus Christ is the boss of your life, you don't understand anything. That's right. The joy is that he's not the boss who wants to dominate and rule and make a harsh life for you. He came that you might have joy and that your joy might be made full. He came that you would have life and have it abundantly. He's not a harsh taskmaster. If you want that, go back into the world and go back to Pharaoh. He was a harsh taskmaster. But Jesus Christ said, here's the way that leads to life. And that way is narrow. 
you got to follow him. And it is about obeying what he has commanded us. And it's trusting in him. And it, you can't trust in somebody unless you believe in them. Well, of course not. So it's, I mean, it's just and and believing isn't just believing, oh yeah, I know that there's a no, God. No, even the, demon, even exactly. the demons believe right. that. I heard a good one that you can believe in a parachute, you can even pull the ripcord. But you have to have the parachute on for it to do any good. That would be a good idea. <laughs> yes, and, and just don't pack a backpack with your lunch in it when you jump out of the air out one. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I lost my train of thought. Ooh, I got to derail here. We're talking about the law. And... Yeah, I know we're talking about the law. And... <laughs> <laughs> okay, we didn't even get to the problem. We didn't get to the lawyer. I, it, one of the things you have to understand about the law. God's word is all meant to be a blessing to us. All right? And when you come to a spiritual appraisal and understanding of the law, you'll see that it's there for good. Not This is not like, okay, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, because he's trying to be harsh. It's like you telling your little child who's walking over to the oven to put his hand on a hot, on a hot stove, mm -hmm. and you say, don't do that. Why do you say don't do that? Because you don't want it's them hurt. It's for his benefit. You don't want them hurt. Okay. All right, so we're going to talk about this, and I, obviously we're going to have to wait until the next session here, I think. But the Ten Commandments and the law in general can be broken into three groups. Three, three groups. Got to get three fingers. Okay, three. <laughs> Those that pertain to our relationship with God. Those that pertain to our relationship with other people. Mm -hmm. And those that purely just affect ourselves. He's thinking about that. But while you're thinking about that... I thought you were going to say food. Well, can it... Can it can That's yourself. Food? Yeah. Well, in the first group, you have... Look, let's just look at the Ten Commandments, right? Mm -hmm. In the first group, God says, I am the Lord thy God. You shall have no other gods before me. You'll not make for yourself any idols, right? Or any likeness of what's in heaven above or on the earth, beneath in the water, right? Mm -hmm. And you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Those are about your relationship with him. And then he says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, is that is that about your relationship with God? No. It's God saying, you need a day rest. of rest. Mm -hmm. And bear in mind, remember that Jesus said in the Gospel of Mark, he said, the man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. Right. This is a law, but we're supposed to keep it because it's supposed to be a blessing to us. And then the third group in the, in the commandments is about your relationship with others. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not kill, or shall not commit adultery, shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor, shall not cover your neighbor's house and cover your neighbor's wife. Or, that's about your relationship with others. So when, when we pick this up again in our next session, this is where I want to start and look at this, that to really understand the law. Part of it is about your relationship with God. Part of it is about your relationship with other people. Part of it is just about you, you and your benefit, all right? Mm -hmm. Remember that the Word says that the Law and the Prophets, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, and this is all the Law and the Prophets. Mm -hmm. Now, nice. you know what? Loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself, that didn't get canceled any time that I know of. I didn't, if it did, I didn't get the notice. Mm, didn't get the I, didn't get a, I didn't get a telegram at the door that said, okay, the law is out. You didn't get the email. No, I didn't get the email. The thing is, it's our understanding of the law and the prophets that has to change. And that's, that's what right. Jesus that's right. is doing here on the Sermon on the Mount. Like I said, He's not teaching anything new. He's not changing the but he's bringing, he's changing our But he is bringing new understanding to it. Hallelujah. Mm. So, Father, we just praise you and thank you Jesus. for your Son, Christ Jesus, the Word made flesh who dwelt among us, the one who did what only he could do, and that was fulfill the law, being obedient to every bit of the law like no human could be. And we thank you, Father, for your law. We thank you for your Word. Lord, knowing that your word is holy, that it is a light, a lamp to guide us in all that we do in our lives. Lord, help us to share that good news of your Son, Christ Jesus, with everybody we come in contact with, everybody we come in contact with. Lord, not to make them look like us, not to make them look like what we think the church ought to be, 
but to make them look like your son Christ Jesus. We thank you that you are the potter and we are the clay. So until our next session, may the Lord our God bless you and we'll see you then.